Jones, and I'm with Peter Manuel in the series Australians Take Back Your Country. And we've had a, as, as is so common, we've had a very challenging week. A week in which the anniversary was marked of the 21st year of the persecution by the communists in China of the Falun Gong. Falun Gong are traditional Chinese believers. They practice the slow motion exercises you see in parks. And they believe essentially in truth, compassion and tolerance. About 21 years ago, as they were growing in size, it dawned on the communists that there were more practitioners of the Falun Gong than all of the membership of the Communist Party. And it's compulsory to be a member of the Communist Party when you're in certain government positions. And the communists became very worried because they had no control over this group. As they're worried about the Uyghurs, those are an ethnic group who are mainly Muslim, as they are worried about the underground Christians, the house Christians, who have Christian services without their services being recorded and watched on video. The communists became very concerned about this. They began a terrible persecution of the Falun Gong, arresting them, torturing them, and then they extended the human organ trade to the Falun Gong. Young, healthy, beautiful practitioners of Falun Gong were taken away. And if they were particularly healthy, they were operated on while alive and their organs taken out to be sold on a trade. And there is a trade. You can see advertisements for it. It's on demand. Everywhere else you wait years for a kidney or other parts of the human anatomy, the human insides. A tribunal was established in London under a QC, Sir Geoffrey Nice, who had been heavily involved in the prosecution of Slobodan Milosevic in the International Court of Justice. They had uh, very eminent human rights people and lawyers and a, a surgeon who was an expert in transplants and hearing the evidence, hearing evidence from doctors who'd been forced to operate, from people who had escaped, they calculated that there was a massive trade. And there clearly is a massive trade because you see advertisements for it. And that these were supplying organs not only on this international market, but also to the rulers of the Communist Party themselves, who were getting the organs as well themselves. A shocking breach of human rights. This from a regime which was responsible under Mao Zedong for about 60% of the over 100 million, it's estimated 100 million people were killed by the communists in the previous century. And Mao Zedong was the biggest murderer of them all, bigger than Stalin. And of course, there's also Hitler who killed another, they think, about 25 million people, including the 6 million Jews. These are shocking crimes. And uh, on the 21st anniversary, there was, there was a, a worldwide objection by lawmakers and prominent people. I was invited to take part. It was done uh, online because of the current restrictions, because of the, the Wahoon virus, the Wuhan virus, which escaped from China and which they kept very quiet about. They sealed up Wuhan and the province, but they let people, probably encouraged people to go overseas. So it was spread around the world a really shocking indictment of the communist government. Now, at that very same time of the 21st anniversary of the beginning of the prosecution, the taxpayer-funded Australian Broadcasting Corporation, the ABC, broadcast 
programs attacking the Falun Gong. It began with a, a planning dispute at a Falun Gong encampment somewhere in a forest in North America. And then they had a, a handful of people, disgruntled practitioners of Falun Gong. Falun Gong learned about it here and they asked to at least be given an interview on it. But the when they did the interview, they didn't tell them what was coming up in the program. Now, this is <clears throat> shocking. And of course, the ABC has been cited with praise in the communist media in China. They've praised our ABC. This is the taxpayer-funded Australian Broadcasting Corporation, which brings me to the other aspect of this. We Australians have been very fortunate since the settlement. We've lived in a world in which the dominant power has been one of us. Similar laws, similar customs, similar constitutional guarantees. Firstly, Britain from the settlement down to almost the Second World War and then the United States. Very similar powers, similar ideas. America is so benign as a great power. At the end of the Second World War, when she was dominant and powerful, she took no territory. And when she occupied the conquered countries, Germany and Japan, she didn't just lend them money, she gave them money under the Marshall Plan and under aid to Japan, so that Germany and Japan now are very wealthy countries. She should probably have lent them the money on the basis that this would be repaid when those countries became restored to the international community. America is a benign power living in a world in which America is the dominant power is most important. But unfortunately, particularly under the previous administration in America, under the Obama administration, the, the, leading, the leading philosophy of that administration was that America was not something exceptional. America was not terribly worthy. So much of the manufacturing had been sent off to China by uh, and changing the trade rules, allowing China to steal a lot of intellectual property, take intellectual property. And this greatly assisted China under the Obama government. Donald Trump has come with a different message. He's come with a message of making America great again, restoring industry to America. He's already made America energy independent, doesn't depend anymore on the Middle East. He's totally opposed to foreign military adventures. And uh, he is building up the armed forces of the United States. Once again, America is becoming clearly, unchallengeably, the dominant power in the world. This is a world we have to live in. We would be in a very unfortunate situation if we were living in a world dominated not by the Chinese, nothing against the Chinese people. The Chinese people don't like communism. When they had a chance in Taiwan, they elected a democratic government. In the local government elections in Hong Kong, they, they scorned the communist candidates and elected anybody else but the communists. Now, of course, the communists have breached the treaty uh, with the United Kingdom concerning the maintenance of two systems in one country. They're taking over Hong Kong completely and bringing their, their dictatorial rule completely to Hong Kong. We cannot, we should not want to live in a world. Or there are some people in Australia, people in big business, others who are making a lot of money out of China, people who are on the payroll of the Chinese. We don't want to live in a world dominated by such a ruthless and dangerous regime. And that's why, and Peter, and you, you and I have discussed this before, it is so important that Donald Trump be re-elected. He has enemies, of course, naturally, the Democrats aren't happy with him. They think they should have won the last election. Never been, they've never accepted the fact that he won the last election. The terrible thing is that the American mainstream media has effectively become the propaganda arm of the Democratic Party. They're not an independent media. They suppress anything good about the 
the uh, Trump administration. They publish anything which is damaging to the Trump administration and exaggerate it. It is very important that that uh, Trump win. There, I've done pieces on these in the the Epoch Times, which is a newspaper based in New York, and also in Spectator. And I'll be putting links to those with this uh, video so people can go and read those if they wish. But this is a very serious situation worldwide that we're in today. And if I could just add one other thing, Peter, before I come to you, and I've been taking up a lot of your time, and please forgive me for that. We've, we've uh, surely at last seen the end of the dismissal. Talk about the dismissal in 1975, which seems to obsess some people who, they're not real Republicans, they want to have a politician's republic, which will increase the power of the politicians in this country. We're always being presented in the news that uh, Gough Whitlam was taken by surprise when Sir John Kerr dismissed him. He wasn't. The only surprise he had was that Kerr had the courage to remove his commission. Gough Whitlam knew, and there's no doubt about this, he knew what he should be doing constitutionally. Once supply is rejected or withheld, it's very clear what a prime minister must do. It's always happened in the past this way. The last time it happened in England in the early part of the 20th century, the prime minister immediately went to the king and asked for an election. And that's what Gough Whitlam should have done. And in fact, five years before he was dismissed, the Labour Party in opposition tried to get the, the DLP, the Democratic Labour Party, to join with them in the Senate to reject supply. In fact, it was since the war, the 170th time, the 170th time that uh, this had happened, that they had asked, the Labour Party had tried to get supply rejected. And uh, they, we know that it was 170 because Senator Murphy, Senator Lionel Murphy, the Attorney General, in the Whitlam government tabled a list of those attempts in the, in the Senate. And it was the 170th time and Gough Whitlam speaking in the House said, and if supply is rejected, if the DLP joins us in the Senate and supply is rejected, the, we know the proper procedure in Westminster parliaments and that is the Prime Minister goes in the election of the people and seeks the people's uh, vote in favour of the continuation of the policies of the government. He knew what to do. He wasn't surprised by Kerr taking by surprise. Kerr says in his memoirs, they discussed it four times. Whitlam says they didn't discuss it four times. They discussed it three times. And the fourth time was a, a flippant occasion when, when Whitlam said it to Tun Abdul Razak, the Malaysian Prime Minister. It was a dinner in Canberra. The Malaysian Prime Minister asked what would happen, and Gough Whitlam said, it all depends on who gets to the palace first. In other words, he suggested that he would, he would advise the Queen to dismiss the Governor-General. Well, Whitlam knew, Gough Whitlam knew what was going to happen, and it's ridiculous for people today to still keep on arguing about it. What Kerr did was his duty, and within a month, the country went to an election, and the people had the decision. He handed over the decision to the people. So on that point, Peter, on that very long introduction, which I hope you will forgive me, Peter, uh, it's, the floor is open to you. Thanks very much, David. Good to have a chat again. Uh, now you cover some uh, very important issues, and uh, people need to know out there what's going on and what has gone on in the past. Uh, in regards to the communist Chinese and the Falun Gong, how can anybody with this, uh, you know, taking organs, how can anybody do that to another human being uh, without anaesthetic? Um, where's the Hu United Nations Human Rights Commission on all this? And I noticed four weeks ago uh, in the Senate, uh, LNP, Labor, Greens, Centre Alliance, 
have all voted for uh, open-ended, unlimited funding for the United Nations. This United Nations is a non-elected dictatorship. We have to exit the United Nations. We can't afford the United Nations. We do not want the United Nations. We need to govern in our own right. And I think it is absolutely disgusting that this uh, LNP, Labor, Centre Alliance and the Greens have all voted in the Senate for open-ended, unlimited funding. Have a look at the mess this country's in money-wise. Have a look at our massive debt. Have a look at how many businesses have gone to the wall. How many Australians haven't got jobs that will never, ever recover? And yet they've got the audacity of giving our hard-earned taxes to the United Nations. I think it's an absolute disgrace. And I, I feel so sad what's happening to the Falun Gong, I really do. In regards to Donald Trump, what a great man. Uh, if we didn't have Trump as the President of uh, the United States of America, uh, the world would be in a very, very big mess, I can assure you. He is uh, creating jobs. Manufacturing is the best it's been since 2004. Uh, the guy is uh, locking up pedophiles. He's, um, to me, he's just a great businessman. He's a great leader. He's a great negotiator. And I think he'll go down as the best president America's ever had. And I just can't understand the mainstream media, the way that they're trying to ridicule him, bring up impeachment on him, uh, you know, the Russian collusion. Just let the guy run the country and leave it up to the people to decide what they want when there's the election. Uh, and God help us if the Democrats get in, because we talk about communism. Well, they're all about it, I can assure you. And uh, I just think that, um, boy, I wish we had a Donald Trump here in, uh, in Australia, because uh, things might start to happen. I mean, We've got a situation with Scott Morrison. I saw an interview the other night with uh, Tracy Grimshaw, current affair. And I couldn't believe how Scott Morrison, we're talking about creating jobs, Scott Morrison doesn't seem to want to say we need to kickstart our manufacturing, we need to kickstart our industry, we need to stop the sale of our agricultural land, our water, and which we know that the biggest port purchase purchaser of our water rights now is the Communist Chinese Party. Uh, we've got to become self-sufficient. We used to make everything in this country and we need to get back to that again. Scott Morrison is not saying that, but Donald Trump is in America. If Scott Morrison was fair dinkum, he cared about Australia, he cared about Australians, he would just, wouldn't hesitate to say, we are going to make things again in this country. And that's what creates jobs. And I've noticed recently he's just put on the um, ex-union boss, Paul Howes. Uh, and what's he uh, been appointed to do? He's been appointed to create new jobs. What sort of money is this guy on? I tell you right now, I'll do it for nothing, Scott Morrison. I'll tell you how to create jobs. And I'm sure you would too, David. This is absolutely ridiculous. And Scott Morrison is also uh, put on uh, some more advisors that are getting $2,000 a day. We can't afford these people. And Scott Morrison, as far as I'm concerned, is rubbing salt into the wounds to every Australian that is absolutely struggling. To do this at a time like this, it is disgusting, David. Peter, uh, you asked... Uh... What's the United Nations doing about the Falun Gong? You asked about the United Nations Human Rights Council, as it's now called. The chair of the United Nations Human Rights Council is from communist China. Uh, and a number of countries <clears throat> on the United Nations Human Rights Council are dictatorships with appalling human rights records. This is the problem with the United Nations. And uh, it, it, is, it, it has not fulfilled what was promised at the end of the Second World War. You asked uh, also about, uh, about uh, the American media. Well, the American media, the mainstream media, has effectively become 
the propaganda arm of the Democratic Party, and the Democratic Party has moved far to the left, so much so that in the current situation, where there are riots, which are ruining businesses and people are being injured and killed, uh, some police, for example, in one of the cities with the use of a laser have been permanently blinded, all sorts of terrible things are happening. These are mainly in democratic controlled cities. And they are saying, and the mainstream media are saying, it's all peaceful, nothing terrible is happening. And uh, in a recent hearing, I think it was today, in the Senate, one of the Republicans, a very good man, Jim Jordan, not all Republicans are very good, but Jim Jordan is an excellent man. He played a video showing terrible scenes in American cities and underneath, in the audio, you could hear Democrat congressmen and senators and presenters on the mainstream media saying all of these, all of these um, protests are all peaceful po protests <laughs> and uh, they're only being made terrible because uh, President Trump is sending in soldiers. Well, he has to send in somebody to protect federal property. The, the situation is becoming appalling and it demonstrates what could well happen in the United States uh, after the election. So we have a, a very bad situation. The other thing is President Trump, they, they, they say President Trump has done nothing in relation to the, the Wuhan virus crisis. Well, he was, he stopped, he was one, one of the ones who, one of the very few countries that first stopped international travel from China and then from Europe, where the virus was also coming in. He stopped it even before we did. And uh, he, he has tried to bring together uh, industry and government. He's, he has accelerated the search for a vaccine. Apparently, they're, they're getting a long way towards that, whether they will achieve that or not. But none of that is being publicized in the American media because they're so intent on attacking him. And you see this, those times that there are press conferences in the White House, you see this in the arrogant and insulting way so-called journalists treat the president. They don't stand when they ask their question. They don't announce who they are. The questions are done in a, not to get information, they're done to attack him. And then when he's given his answer, they then, when he's go, moved on to another speaker, they try to raise second and third supplementary questions. They are very insulting, impertinent and rude, and it is all an attempt to denigrate one of the finest presidents they've had in the United States for a considerable period of time. He would be re-elected without any problem but for this, this uh, virus. I, I still think he will be re-elected. I think the polls are wrong. Those are the same polls, which uh, were polls predicting in 2016 that Mrs. Clinton would be elected. Uh, and polls, even good polls, can have serious errors. As I tried to, I, I wrote in a Spectator article that the polls in Australia for the last election, who all predicting that Labour would win, had serious errors in them. Nobody corrected me, but I think I was right in those errors because uh, the polls were shown to be wrong and uh, Morrison government came in and we didn't have a shortened government. Uh, but uh, they, the, the polls are also in a more difficult position because of what was called in England the shy Tory phenomenon. And this is that not only conservatives, but anybody who's not sprouting far left views, the far left views which are required thinking and speaking this week. People are worried because you're answering polls on the telephone now and everybody knows that with digital searching, it is not difficult to connect a telephone number. They know what your telephone number is. It's not difficult to connect that telephone number with you. It's easy to find out a person's identity who's being phoned for their opinion on a telephone. And we've seen what happens to people including left-wing people who are not uh, endorsing the current view this week, which the thugs, the 
the people in the BLM, which are being run by communists, they are self-confessed communists, Marxists, communists, and anarchists. They're not interested in maintaining the present system. They want to overthrow it. And they can easily find out who you are if you give an opinion. So people are being very careful sensibly about the opinions they give over the telephone to a complete stranger at the other end. Those can be used against you, and people are very worried about that sort of thing. We're entering a very dangerous period in the United States and in the Western world, and we have to be very careful and let us hope that President Trump is re-elected in November. Peter. Yes, David, I, I agree. I think President Trump will bolt in. Uh, I don't believe these polls anymore for one minute. I think they're trying to guide people on how to vote. Uh, I look back to the uh, election with Nick Xenophon, uh, who was going to win 30 lower house seats here in South Australia, and he was going to be the kingmaker, future premier, and all the rest of it. He didn't win a seat. Didn't win a seat. So I think the mainstream uh, media, people have really woken up to them. Uh, I think they're self-destructing, and uh, we don't trust them anymore, uh, which... Sadly, uh, that's the way it goes. But um, just on, on Trump, um, I'm just amazed how the guy just looks so fresh, he looks so calm, uh, and he just goes about his business. He's, he's doing the, uh, the grassroots movement and uh, he's getting the message out there. Uh, the African uh, Americans are about 20%, he's got about 20% of the vote. But to me, Anybody the mainstream media is having a crack at and rubbishing, they're the ones you want to look at. They're the good ones because the mainstream media now are looking after the uh, far left, the radical left, and it's just disgusting. And I don't know what these people want the world to be, but uh, they just, uh, as far as I'm concerned, well, I do know they want total control. And... Uh, we don't want that. We don't need that. We need people that actually care about others and uh, and want a prosperous world. And we want a world that we all get on together. And unfortunately, we're never going never gonna to have that. But uh, we can go a long way towards it, David. Yes, I in 2016, when I looked at his agenda, and he was very open about his agenda, I thought if he if he attains half of that, it will be magnificent. Comparing that with Mrs. Clinton, who would be a continuation of Obama. And Obama was about managing the decline of the United States, virtually handing over the future to the communists in Beijing. And uh, there were wonderful things in the Trump agenda, and he, in many ways he achieved them. He, he achieved full employment. In, it was full employment not only generally, but for Afro-Americans. He improved their situation in relation his, to his reforms of the criminal law. He made America energy independent. He brought back a lot of manufacturing to the United States. And uh, he he promised to deal with judicial activism, which has, they, they say Black Lives Matter. Well, the, 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 the unborn who've most suffered from the Supreme Court's decision to, to create, to imagine, to invent, a constitutional right to abort, have been black babies. Disproportionate amount of black babies have died because of that. And in recent times, they've introduced legislation to initiate infanticide. That is the killing of infants. Those babies that escaped an abortion could be terminated, as the, the nice way of saying killed. They could be killed too. The same sort of thing was attempted in New South Wales, curiously, curiously, with an enormous amount of national support in the New South Wales Parliament. They dropped the infanticide path because that was too much for the rest of the community. But there's, there seems to be an obsession with killing life rather than encouraging life. And President Trump was very strong in that. We saw what they did to his nominations, Justice Kavanaugh, for example. They just, they just created lies about Kavanaugh as they did the earlier judge who he appointed. He's appointed a lot of sensible judges who interpret the law as it was intended to be interpreted, not the law as 
is imagined to fulfill some some uh, far left agenda and he is cleaning that up too that's very important because the american supreme court is copied by courts all over the world they all think that they they're appointed to change the constitution they say the constitution is a living document therefore it means what we want it to mean and not what it was originally intended to mean this is very important that this this man continue his presidency because this will change the direction of the united states and there are young people who are coming up like uh, the, the 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 senator the congressman i referred to and others who will continue what he has done but i agree with you he's an extraordinary man very strong man to have the sort of treatment he's had continuously for almost four years is extraordinary and that he hasn't wilted in that and he's been able to stand up to it is testimony to the man's inner strength and his inner beliefs and i think i think you're right i certainly he's a great president and uh, i can't think of a greater president uh, in say from the second world war apart from uh, i would say the other two great presidents were truman a democrat and uh, and uh, president reagan a magnificent president who who brought down the soviet union without firing a shot which i think was a magnificent achievement so on that peter do you think it's time to bring this to a conclusion or do you wish to add something I'd like to add a couple of things. First of all, uh, in regards to uh, President Trump, he doesn't owe anybody anything. He paid for that campaign with his own money. I think he takes a dollar. That's all he <laughs> takes out of his way, one dollar. And he donates it to uh, very, very good causes. Uh, Scott Morrison, he takes all the money. And uh, whether it was Bill Shorten or any others, they all take all the money. I just wish that... Uh, uh, be nice if uh, Donald Trump could see this interview, uh, David, because uh, I would urge him to have a word to Scott Morrison about the ridiculous thing that they've just done, uh, open-ended, unlimited funding to the United Nations. I don't think Donald Trump would agree with that one. And uh, I, just, uh, I just got a really good feeling that he'll bolt in. Uh, and he needs to bolt in for, for the safety of the world, to be quite honest. And the true democracy. But David, if I could just bring up uh, one other thing, we've had um, some ministers here in South Australia recently that uh, with travel rorts, uh, they were, um, yeah, doing some underhanded things with their travel rorts and uh, they're no longer ministers now. But what really annoys a lot of South Australians, these ministers are just put on the back bench. Uh, Stephen Marshall, our Premier, uh, accepted their resignation. Well, that's not good enough. They should have been sacked. They've stolen from the people of South Australia. These people are on, I think they're on enough money that to be able to do this and rip us off, I can guarantee you, if you were working for me and I found out that you were stealing from me, you wouldn't only be sacked, I'd have you charged. So surely these ministers have got to be charged but they're sitting back there, still earning a wage and all the rest of it, good money, mind you, still voting on legislation. I think it's just so wrong. What can we do about this, David? I mean, there's a lot of people saying, you know, why can't they be sacked? Why can't they be thrown out? Because the people voted them in. We are fully aware of that. But how would we get around this in the future, David? One of the things which we're proposing in Take Back Your Country in a constitutional convention for reforming the constitution which will only come if people manifest their strength their strong belief in change one of the things which we must have and i said we, we call them the five r's and one of them is recall elections the people by petition should be able to recall any member of parliament or a government they should be able to and they should be able to require a further election. Now, this happens in some American states and one American province. And I think that that is a, an important constitutional reform which should come in so that the politicians and these, the rest of the five of ours are 
related. I won't go over them tonight. I'll put a reference to to that in the in the the text which will go with this video. But what we want, what we should want, is not that politicians be accountable in so-called elections, which are confected to the extent that pre-selections are pre-arranged and they're not done as in America on the basis of merit. They're done because, in many cases, because of the loyalty 